All right, well, uh, as Rigo said, my name is Brian Crawford. I'm a third year student out of Warnell, and I'm definitely happy to talk to you today about our ongoing research on the Jekyll Island Causeway and its effects on this guy right here, the Dimeback Terrapin, as well as the community at large. So before I get started, I absolutely have to thank all our collaborators through this long-term research, as well as our funders, and I especially want to thank the Georgia Sea Turtle Center. They've been a long-term partner with us and uh, have been really essential on a day-to-day -day basis, so thanks to them. And I also just wanted to thank uh, the, the organizers of the symposium. This is a really cool opportunity, and I know we're all appreciative. All right, well, I'm going to start off pretty basic. Our uh, research is really based on two fundamental principles about roads. So first of all, roads are everywhere. They represent this pervasive human footprint across the landscape. And uh, this study, which is almost 10 years old now, I think illustrates it really well. So what these authors found is if they picked you up in a helicopter, flew you around the continental US, and dropped you at a random location, 80% of the time, you'd be within one kilometer of the nearest road. More importantly, uh, this dark green area on the eastern United States map here, including uh, the coast of Georgia, where we'll end up in a second, 60 to 80% of that dark green area is within 400 meters of the nearest road. So 400 meters a kilometer, these are well within the movement capabilities of most species. And so this whole field of road ecology has emerged to study the effects of roads on environments and species. Now this brings us to our second point about roads that our research is based on. For a Dimeback Terrapin, a road is an extremely dangerous place to be, <laughs> even if they have perfect 10-2 driving posture. So the real picture uh, that Terrapins face on roads is no less harrowing. Though. So if you haven't met the species before, this is the Dimeback Terrapin. They live on coastal salt marshes along the eastern Gulf Coast. And these are areas, like Dean said, um, you know, they're experiencing a high rate of development which includes roads that bisect their habitat. So why are roads a problem to the terrapin? Well, we don't really have to overthink this too much. These are turtles. They're not going to be able to dodge oncoming vehicles the way raccoons could or other animals that we're used to. But more importantly, and specifically to terrapins, they're attracted to roads, actually. So they kind of function as an ecological trap. So living in the marsh, they're looking for high open ground to lay their eggs on and roadways are built above the high tide line. So these roadsides are actually perfect habitat, um, or you know, perfect habitat for terrapins to nest. Also, unfortunately for the terrapin, this nesting occurs in the summer months, May through July. Just so happens to be when traffic volumes are highest in these coastal areas. So with these concepts in mind, I'm gonna break down our project into two phases. I'm gonna briefly describe the early phase uh, that went into my master's research and then transition us into phase two when I started the ICON program and uh, start to incorporate some of these more integrative elements. So to get your bearings, here we have uh, my study site. This is Jekyll Island. And the road cutting across the middle of that picture is, a, is the seven mile long Jekyll Island Causeway. Now, this causeway from the Georgia Sea Turtle Center monitoring it, we knew going into it, it was a regional hotspot of road mortality. So they actually found that one to 400 terrapins were being killed on this road alone each year. But you know that, that number might be a little alarming, but it really doesn't tell us what's happening at a population level. So our first question we had to answer is, at a population level, is this road actually threatening the species? And there's a graphic image coming up, just to warn you, but the short answer is yes. This level of road mortality was not sustainable for the population. So we used mark recapture and uh, some population modeling to figure this out, that road mortality, as well as nest predation that was happening along roadsides from these overabundant subsidized predator populations like raccoons, both of these threats were actually contributing to population declines at this site. So with that in mind, it seems like we need to do something. So our next uh, question was to prioritize where and when management should be placed. I won't go into the analysis that you know, went into this approach, but we identified hot spots and hot moments of road mortality, and Nate was instrumental in this part as well. So all I want you to take away from this uh, image is that we were able to break down the seven miles of road into just a few key places where road mortality occurred at the highest rate. So all else being equal, these three little red so zones should be the priorities for management. 
Now, in the same way, we found temporal peaks of terrapin activity on that road that might be able to be used for management. So this is the results of our linear regression modeling that I want to present. Um, and here you see we're graphing the probability that a terrapin's on the road uh, on a daily basis and a seasonal basis. So for the daily pattern, you see you have the hours to high tide, and you see the terrapins were more likely to be on the road at high tide relative to low tide. And specifically, uh, this doesn't show it, but we found that there was a sweet spot, like a three-hour window around high tide where terrapins were most likely to be on the road. And over the course of a season, uh, this end of the axis is May 1st through July 20th. You see there's a peak in activity towards the beginning of the season, about middle of May to middle of June, when crossing activity and road mortality was highest. So we're starting to figure out how this threat operates in order to make management recommendations. But let me take a step back and give you a high-level overview of our approach we took in transitioning from that phase that I just covered into phase two. So here's another image of the Jekyll Island Causeway. This is the threat we were faced with when we got down there. And like uh, most good wildlife managers, when we got down there, we focused almost entirely on the terrapin. All right? So we studied all the ecological dimensions we could of this threat in order to come up with management that is hopefully biologically effective. So knowing what we knew now, our next inclination might be to jump up, put up roadside barriers, make hats out of raccoons, just get these animals off the road <laughs> any way we could. <laughs> now, especially this crowd might know where I'm going. We might not have a problem with any of that, but chances are everybody else using that road might have a problem with it. So before we acted on any of these impulses, we took a step back and measured the human dimensions of this human-wildlife interaction. And our idea is that when we combine this with what we already know, we can really start to form management recommendations that meet our goals for the terrapins as well as every uh, group of users on that road. So with that, we'll transition into phase two where I'll spend the rest of the time talking about uh, mostly this objective, where we measured stakeholders' attitudes, or the people that were using that road, um, measure their attitudes towards management, and look for areas of potential conflict. And then lastly, I'll leave you with a little glimpse of how we started to incorporate all this information into actual management on the causeway, which we're very excited about. So let's talk about attitudes for a second. In 2012, we went down to Jekyll Island and used standard sociological surveys to measure these attitudes. And we identified three major patron groups that were using the road and therefore uh, affected by any management decisions that we come up with. And these were visitors, residents, and employees of Jekyll Island. For visitors, we used on-site surveys in person um, across different visitation hotspots on the island, like beaches and picnic areas. And uh, we got a really high response rate, as you see. People were very receptive to what we were doing, very eager to share their opinions, so that was great. We put the same survey online and distributed it to listservs that we had access to for residents and employees. But this yielded a lower than expected response rate, so we just followed this up with some more um, on-site surveys of these groups in order to get adequate sample sizes for each. What do we measure? Well, we packed quite a bit into a very short survey, but I mainly want to talk about two different types of attitudes that we looked at. The first is general attitudes. So we asked these general questions like, should we manage terrapins on the causeway? And asked people to agree or disagree with it. And we used these three items to create a combined general attitude score for each respondent. But next, we actually had in mind a list of management actions that we were either starting to test out on small scales or that we had heard been done on other roads. And we asked people's attitudes towards specific management, so how acceptable each of these and a lot more that I'm not showing you are. Now, these specific actions covered a, a wide range of things, some that affected drivers directly, like lowering the speed limit or using these flashing lights you see here that you might see again. Um, some actions that directly targeted terrapins, like putting up barriers, simple things like that. And then remember that raccoon predation problem, uh, it was a problem, so we needed to ask how, the, how people felt about even lethally removing raccoons. Through surveying about 1,300 people, uh, we were able to find that there was very high support for general terrapin management. This was a very supportive community. Um, 
and, but that story changed when we started to look at attitudes towards specific actions. So I ranked these in order of acceptability. And what we saw is that there was a group of actions that seemed to be highly acceptable across respondents, like using short fences, those flashing lights that you saw. There were a group of actions that were mildly acceptable, like reducing the speed. And then there was a group of actions that was relatively unacceptable, like putting concrete barriers up or lethally removing raccoons. But again, I want to point out that the least acceptable action was to do nothing. So again, general support for terrapin management. People wanted uh, this problem addressed in some way, but maybe weren't always satisfied with the options we were giving them. So we took this analysis one step further. We wanted to break the responses up back into those three patron groups and look for any differences in attitudes within and across these groups. So we used what's called the potential for conflict index. And what this does is measure the mean and dispersion of these responses. So I'll give you an example. We show these using bubble graphs. So this is, these are people's attitudes in each patron group for general management. Now the size of the bubble and the number next to it represents the potential for conflict index. This number ranges from 0 to 1. 0 meaning minimum conflict, 1 meaning maximum conflict. So the larger the bubble, the bigger the conflict was within that group. Uh, people you know, were more in, in, had a higher disagreement towards their attitudes towards that management action. So for general management, you see everybody's pretty much in agreement and um, thinking that this is an acceptable option. However, when we looked at attitudes towards flashing lights, reducing the speed, and using concrete barriers, two patterns began to emerge. First of all, you can see visitors always tended to find these actions more acceptable than residents and employees. And we can go into why that is maybe after this. The other thing that I noticed was, besides the, the last concrete barrier example, visitors tended to be more in agreement about their attitudes towards management, and uh, there's more conflict within residents and employees. Now finally, our option to lethally remove raccoon was definitely sort of a hot button issue, and it displayed some of the highest levels of conflict across each group. We've had many takeaways from this project, but I'll leave you with a few. One, we saw the population was declining given the, cur given the current rates of these threats, so intervention is needed. And the best way to get after that is probably to target those hot spots and hot moments of road mortality. Now that we have our, our information on people's attitudes towards management, we can now begin to start to identify acceptable management actions and test their biological effects. And I'll let Tara talk about this next, but we're going to use a structured decision-making approach to do that. Lastly, the potential for conflict index gave us a good look into hopefully you know, what potential trade-offs uh, we need to navigate in moving forward with, when we start to apply some of these contentious options especially. Um, it also will help us tailor our education programs and maybe target residents or employees uh, on the effects and you know, get, their, get their knowledge increased about how the system works, how raccoons are affecting the population, things like that. Lastly, I'll leave you with just a glimpse into what we did last summer. We were able to put up two turtle crossing flashing signs. These are the first ever constructed. Um, and they were geared at, at making drivers more aware of when turtles were out on the road. So it kind of works like a school zone. We set these to flash around three hours around high tide each day. So we knew when the kids were going to be on the road, that's when they were flashing. And you can program them ahead of time uh, all season. Now, it's just one summer's worth of data, and we'll monitor them again last, next summer. But I just want to point out that we found a lower percentage of struck and dead terrapins when uh, the signs were on versus when they were off. It's just one summer's worth. We can't draw too many conclusions. But it does seem like they're lowering the rate of road mortality, uh, just at, in least, at least in that direction. So thank you very much. Um, that's all I have for you. I'd love to take your questions. But uh, if you want to email me them as well, that would be great. And thank you very much for listening.